Good afternoon. This is the Corusco Conference Operator. Welcome and thank you for joining the SNAM Full Year 2020 Financial Results Conference Call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Should anyone need assistance during the conference call, they may signal an operator by pressing star and zero on their telephone. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Marco Alvera, CEO of SNAM. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to SNAM's full year 2020 results presentation. 2020 has been a very difficult year all over the world. Lombardy was the first region to be hit outside of China, and the first lockdowns were only a few miles from here. We were able to ensure the safety of our people, adopting special protocols for essential staff working in the dispatching centers. We guaranteed uninterrupted gas flows and full commercial and technical availability of our grid and storage, and we played a significant role in supporting local communities where and how we could. During this very complex time, we've managed to exceed our original guidance and to continue to press ahead with our strategic positioning internationally and in the energy transition businesses. Project delivery is our key feature, and we expect this to become increasingly sought after for the energy transition. SNAM managed to recover operational delays to deliver our investment budget for the 14th year in a row. The 1.2 billion euros we invested is almost a quarter higher than our capex in 2019, and we're planning to increase this further by 14% to 1.4 billion euros in 2021. That is a good example of our capability to deliver major undertakings. This was one of the most complex projects in our industry and started up ahead of schedule after four and a half years of work. Our 300 million euro equity investment in TAP will result in an annual contribution of around 55 million euros from this year. Strategically, we also made significant headway, entering into the shareholder base of ADNOC gas pipelines, being the only industrial player in a large consortium of infrastructure funds. We've also made investments in the hydro hydrogen value chain through Denora and our small stake in ITM Power. Meanwhile, our energy transition startups broke even in 2020, despite some delays caused by COVID. Hydrogen, biomethane, energy efficiency, and sustainable mobility will be key pillars of our long-term growth opportunity. Helped by a strong contribution from international associates and lower financing costs, net profit rose to 1.164 million euros far exceeding pre-pandemic guidance of 1.1 billion. In 2020, we've delivered another year of strong growth. Regulated revenues are driven by continued investment in the network and higher allowed DNA, counterbalanced by the phasing out of older input-based incentives and the decrease linked to the commodity component of our revenue due to the decline in 2020 volume. In 2020, we saw the inclusion of energy costs in revenues, which were previously addressed in kind for around 60 million euros. These contribute to revenues and costs with essentially no impact on EBITDA. Adjusted EBITDA benefited from the contribution of new energy transition businesses, the continuing effect of the efficiency program launched in 2016, and some additional COVID-related savings, mainly lower travel costs and prolonged smart working uh, for 2020. Income from associates was up 33 million euros compared to last year, benefiting from the inclusion of ADNOC and the startup of TAP, plus another, a number of other effects, which are uh, some of them specific to 2020, for a total of 30 million euro positive one-offs. Alessandro will go into more detail on this in a second. On top of all of this, Financial charges were 39 million euros lower in 2020, and this gave us our net profit growth of 6.5%. In 2020, we also made continuing progress on our ESG strategy. We've introduced an ESG scorecard defining 22 targets on which we provided a 2020 baseline, and we will report progress on these regularly. You'll find details in the backup. Among our key areas of focus is the reduction of our carbon footprint. 
We've adhered to the UMEP protocol, and we commit to a 45% cut in methane emissions by 2025. As you might recall, in November, we announced scope one and two targets of a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030 compared to 2018, which is our base year. And we've also committed to carbon neutrality by 2040. We're making significant progress on our strategy of emissions reductions, with 2020 emissions down 5% year on year and already 15% compared to 2018. Looking at the S in ESG, we believe that well-being will become a key metric. We have focused on the well-being of SNAM's employees and our communities in this difficult year with initiatives including medical and psychological support, virtual gym memberships, and the reimbursement of child minding expenses. We're launching, together with the University of Oxford and other important partners, the World Wellbeing Movement, a global partnership which will promote a simple measure of well-being as a key ESG indicator. Our leadership in ESG is confirmed by the awards obtained and by our strong positioning within the key ESG ratings. We will hold a webinar dedicated to our ESG initiatives and strategy in April. Thank you for your attention. I'll now hand over to Alessandra. Thank you, Marco. Adjusted net profit in 2020 was 1 billion 164 million euro, up 71 million euro compared to the same period of uh, 2019. EBITDA core rose by 15 million as effect of on the revenue side, the continuous investment offset by reduction of input based incentives and the volume effect of the component, commodity component, which impacted year on year 17 million euro. On the cost side, the decrease of 18 million euro in both core fixed costs and other core items due to ongoing effects and some specific of 2020. On the structural side, the benefit of the ongoing efficiency program has been partially offset by higher staff costs due to growing perimeter and inflation. In 2020, we benefited from massive reports to smart working related to the COVID situation, fewer extraordinary growth projects, lower capitalized costs, lower accrual, and other items, partially offset by the lack of release of a pre-retirement fund that we had in 2019. The new business uh, portfolio contributed positively for 30 million euro year on year, despite delays due to COVID. These startups, and some such as mobility and hydrogen, are not yet at break even. Uh, in the main positive contributors, we had some global solution our energy efficiency platform, which consolidated NIH and Evolve, and the biomass and business with the first full year of contribution of runaway and a better performer of yet less. We expect new businesses to continue to gain momentum in 2021. Other positive effects on net income came from lower net interest expenses, which we will comment later on, also thanks to the OLT financial income from shoulder loans, and strong performance of our international portfolio that I will describe in the next slide. Looking at our international source in more detail, the increase of net income contribution in 2020 versus 2019 was driven by the contribution of ADNOC since July for 20 million euro. This includes a positive one-off impact related to the refinancing that was completed between the end of last year and the beginning of this year. We expect a substantial, substantial reversal of this in the course of 2021 as a result of adjustments related to the acquisition agreement. We confirm an expectation of an average 15 million annual contribution over the 20 years contract horizon. The first positive contribution of SAP, which accounted for 15 million in 2020, due to a one month and a half operation, the fact that last year was a loss making still being under construction and a one off contribution in connection with a business related settlement. Thanks, positively contributed by 10 million more versus prior year due to one off item of approximately 4 million and recognition of CAPEX and the end of the regulatory period. These were partially offset by Terega due to the new regulation in, play, in place since the 1st of April. The positive one-off effect accounted in 2019 connected to the release of a tax provision and the decrease of the contribution of IUK mainly linked to the lower capacity book versus prior year. At our sources, we promote strategy coherent with our broader view 
in terms of emission reduction and exposure to energy transition and promotion of green gases. Perega, for instance, is entering the biomethane market and has joined the ideal ambition, a coalition of which we are also part, that aims at reducing the cost of production of green hydrogen below 1.5 euro per kilo. Several of our sources are starting to work on hydrogen assets readiness. Looking ahead to 2021, we expect an overall contribution of our associates, international and Italian, almost in line with 2020, but with a different mix. The 20 year specific positive effect for 2020 will not be replicated. We expect lower contribution from our astron activities in line with new regulation and different contractual setup, and that's what to normalize its performance. This will be offset by the full year contribution of TAP and the contribution of the North. Turning now to our cash flow, from op- cash flow from operation was 1.6 billion euro, including 269 of working capital absorption, of which 158 million of tariff related, related items, 32 million of net tax table, and 32 million of absorption of capital, working capital from our energy efficiency business. Cash flow from operation covered capex and capex table, and the M&A referring to the acquisition of OLT, ADNOC, and the stake in ITM Power. Uh, instead, the acquisition of the NORA, which was announced in November, was completed in January 2021, and therefore its effect on the net financial position will be visible for Q1 2021. Other outflows of the year have been the dividend payment and the share buyback uh, amount. This led to a net debt at the end of 2020 of 12.9 billion euros versus a guidance of 20.8, mainly due to higher related tariff absorption of 158 million versus the circa 100 assumption that we gave before. Moving on to demand extraction and the reduction in the cost of debt. Our average gross cost of debt in 2020 was down from 1.1 to 0.9, mainly thanks to the bond rollover effect with the replacement of overall 1.4 billion of bond expired in 2020, with new debt raised a very positive condition, even a peculiar year. The continuous effort in treasury management optimization as shown by the increase in the size of our euro commercial paper from 2 billion to 2.5 and the utilization of uncommitted lines, both a deeply negative yield. And the proactive management of maturities with our fixed liability management transaction and a one year extension of our 3.2 billion sustainable loan. Debt related net financial charge were down by circa 20 million, driven therefore by the lower cost of debt, offsetting circa 1 billion increase in average debt. On sustainable finance, BSG is, is a key element uh, in our financing choices. In 2020, SNAM has raised circa 1.7 billion of new sustainable financing instruments with two transition bond issued and commercial paper under our new ESG rated program, reaching a total amount of approximately 7 billion euro, equal to circa 40% sustainable finance on total committed funding. As occurred in our strategic plan in November, our ambition and goal is and remain to increase this number up to 60% by 2024. I now hand over back to Marco. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, let's now look at our 2021 outlook. We confirm our guidance for 1.4 billion euros of investments. We're approving our net income to 1.170 million euros, including the Denora contribution for over 10 million euros. This is an improvement compared to the guidance provided at our strategy presentation in November of 1.130 million euros. Plus 3% versus 2020 net profit guidance. It is mainly related to lower costs and financial charges. The result is also supported by rising contribution of our new businesses. Full year 2021 net debt is now foreseen at around 14 billion euros with debt to RAB set to remain below 60%. Denora is performing better than expected and there are now a number of strategic options to realize value from our investments. We confirm our dividend policy of 5% dividend growth to 2022 and 2.5% minimum from 2022 to 2024, offering a visible and compelling shareholder's return. Thank you for your attention. We're now happy to take your questions. 
Excuse me. Uh, this is the Corusco conference operator. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchtone telephone. To remove your staff from the question queue, please press star and two. Please pick up the receiver when asking questions. Anyone who has a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from Javier Suarez with Media Banca. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you for the for the presentation. Uh, three questions. The first one is on the on the uh, on the new administration in Italy, a new government, new minister for ecological transition. So the question for you is: any feedback or update in the initial conversations with the new administration and the new minister on their their view or his view on the role for uh, gas transmission networks and the overall hydrogen opportunity? That would be the first question. The second question is on the 2021 guidance. Uh, so the, uh, the the company uh, has increased quite substantially the net income guidance for 2021. So you can help us to understand if that is due to a better performance when it comes to cost reduction, or that has to do mainly with the, the development and of new business opportunities. And then the, the third question is on the international subsidies. Um, uh, during the presentation has been mentioned the, that the numbers should be similar, but the composition should be different. But uh, I, I was not, I'm not completely sure that I could follow the argument, so you could kindly repeat why it's different in the composition. And uh, I guess that these one-offs are going to disappear, and the number is going to be the same one without one-off. Is that the, the argument? Many thanks. Okay, Javier, I'll take the first two, and then, Ale, you can uh, reconcile the moving parts of our international portfolio. So the, the government has been very explicit on uh, their view of hydrogen. Uh, just based on public, the available information, the uh, word hydrogen was included in two of uh, the prime minister's speeches, and uh, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, Minister Cingolani, who leads the uh, ecological transition, which is the combination of the former environmental ministry plus a large part, if not most of the energy-related part of the previous uh, economic development ministry. They're being merged. Uh, and Cingolani, the day before yesterday, came out uh, saying that he expects a hydrogen strategy to be available soon. And there's a lot of work ongoing on the IPSES, which are the European Projects of Common Interest, which, which is something that Italy is, is very keen to work on, and uh, Germany is uh, leading uh, this program uh, with uh, early projects expected already by uh, July for a first screening. Now, the good news is that in order to present uh, projects for this screening, uh, our understanding is that in Germany there's something around 400 projects being uh, identified right now that, that will certainly be reduced over time uh, as, as they get filtered and analyzed. But one of the conditions, of course, is that the projects need to be uh, bankable. And so there needs to be a combination of uh, some regulatory framework, uh, some uh, subsidies, some industry sector uh, specific. So we expect that between now and July there's going to be a lot of uh, work to uh, define the details. So hydrogen strategy expected by April, and then a lot of policy work thereafter. On um, on the guidance for 2021, uh, there is around 40 million difference, and as I mentioned, coming from Denora, and the rest almost evenly split between our performance on our debt and interest charge and the rest is a combination of better performance on costs and, and revenues. Ale, do you want to go through the international associates? Yes, uh, Javier, on, uh, on the 2020 numbers, we have uh, fewer events, which we call one-off, uh, which I can repeat. Uh, there is a business-related settlement uh, in relation to TAP, which uh, uh, is worth more than $10 million, which is not, not going to be there uh, in 2021. There was a one-off of uh, around $5 million related to AMOC, which will be effectively more than reversed in 2021. This is in, in, in relation to the acquisition mechanism that we entered into in 2020. 
there was a one-off effect of around 5 million uh, for a specific uh, uh, tariff-related uh, recognition that it relates to, to TAG, and there was also one-off uh, related to our retail gas. So overall, we have approximately 30 million of literally one-off. Uh, we also had, in 2020, a very strong performance by some of our sources, which is a different concept. Uh, DESPA performed very strongly, uh, and, uh, and the Austrian, again, in general, performed uh, very strongly. When we look at 2021, uh, and, and the, the type of different mix, you will have a greater contribution from TAP, because effectively, uh, we always said that at regime TAP uh, reaches 60 million. Uh, 2021 is still a year of transition between a company that is set up for a construction phase, the company that operates the pipeline. So we are not probably going to be reaching this 60 million uh, yet, but uh, thereabout. Uh, we have uh, this a vis uh, the ad hoc uh, performance, uh, uh, something shorter because of the reversal that I referred to before than the 50 million on average that we expect from this investment over a period of, of uh, 20 years. And we have a normalization of, of DESPA, which performed very strongly in 2020 and will be in line with the, let's say, 15 million uh, typical year contribution that we would expect. And at the same time, the effect of the new regulation in, in Austria and a different contractual setup with more short-term contract versus long-term contract, which will have an impact uh, of uh, uh, lowering the contribution from our Austrian associates. Net-net, you will still have approximately the same uh, 250 million, broadly speaking, between our Italian and international associates. Many thanks. The next question is from Harry Weibler with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. I've got three. Uh, it's the first one, just a, a follow-up on your answer to Javier's question on the projects of common interest and in submitting projects of screening. We've begun to hear a little bit from um, some of your utility peers in Europe that the uh, sort of projects that, that might be possible under EU stimulus spending are actually turning out perhaps to be a bit higher than interest in general companies have expected it when they set their capex plans back in in last autumn so I'd just be interested to get your view on uh, where you think things are developing particularly with your um, sort of hydrogen uh, exposure or your new, new businesses exposure do you think we're we could see a situation where there are actually more projects that your businesses could get involved in than you, you'd anticipated when you when you set your uh, CapEx guidance, I guess, only a few months ago. So that's the first one. Uh, second one on the regulatory review, it's, it's a very specific question um, on the formula. So uh, my understanding was that um, because this is a, a sort of full review, so to speak, um, that the actual WAC formula itself would be reviewed and therefore that there might be some potential for the formula itself to change. Obviously, we can put the parameters into the current formula and, and get an estimate of what we think might happen to the WAC. Uh, but I'm just interested if you could clarify whether you, uh, whether it's possible that some of the, the, the formula construction itself might, might actually change. Um, and then final one on inflation. I think, if I, if I remember correctly, you'd assumed inflation of 0.9% in your plan. Um, obviously, inflation's a, a very closely watched, watched issue at the moment. Is, is there any way you can give any kind of sense as to the sensitivity, perhaps, of your, your earnings growth um, if inflation was to be materially higher than 0.9%? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Harry. So, um, as you recall, we have around 150 million of capex for hydrogen in our five-year plan presented in November, and that is um, essentially on on the railway projects that are kind of in the money, even without um, subsidies. Uh, of course, we we hope to make them more attractive with some subsidies to support those. So it's still early days. Things are moving fast, but we will update you as we know how much of our own projects make it through. Uh, these hurdles and how much uh, those projects will be, let's say, subsidized uh, through uh, incentives. Of course, the capex will be a function of the type of subsidy. We are believers that contracts for difference are the best types of subsidies for these 
long-term projects linked to infrastructure, the national uh, recovery uh, plan of, of Italy and other countries uh, as a post-COVID effort has to be spent by 2026. So it's not catered for that type of longer-term um, subsidy. Uh, so we, we have to wait and see how these discussions pan out. I can assure you that across Europe, a number of uh, policymakers across different countries, across different ministries within each country is, is working on this. So we'll update you as we have news. We have uh, quite a number of attractive projects that we're uh, inserting in, in these funnels. On the regulatory review, we hope there is uh, a change in the formula. By putting in the current numbers and the current forward curves in the formula, you see uh, a significant impact. We think there are arguments to be made that the formula should uh, be adjusted, not to take the full blow of uh, what a mark-to-market would be. We expect some news uh, in late spring with an early consultation coming out. And again, you'll hear more from us and all the other uh, utilities uh, if and when that happens. Around inflation, certainly our RAB is inflation adjusted. So we, we are geared uh, to inflation if indeed uh, there is uh, there is a rise. One uh, percent inflation has around 20, as as is obviously a function of, of the RAB, uh, has a 20 million euro impact off a 20 billion RAB uh, two years later. That's more or less what you should assume if you want to if you want to model this. Thank you. Got it. Many thanks. The next question is from Enrico Bartoli with the Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. First for taking my question. I have uh, two left. Uh, one is related to your cost of debt. If you can guide us to what to expect for 2021, and uh, you made uh, a very significant uh, reduction in your average cost of debt, so you think that uh, you have uh, still room uh, to optimize it. Uh, a second is related to, to the NORA. You, you indicated uh, the, uh, the impact that you expect net profit in 2021. I, I, I was uh, uh, wondering uh, uh, if you can give some details on uh, how you expect uh, to consolidate the company. And if I remember well, uh, uh, the NORA should be one of the assets that you were planning to uh, transfer to a special fund related to energy transition. Uh, if this uh, uh, is going to happen in 2021, and uh, if you can update us on uh, this project. Thank you. Denora is uh, performing better than expected. Uh, but apart from Denora's performance that we will not consolidate because we have a 37% stake in the company, what is interesting is not only the growing excitement around hydrogen components, and we've seen our investment in ITM, for example, double uh, in value recently. Uh, we have seen uh, public commentary around the value of the stake that Denora has in the Thyssen joint venture for the manufacturing of electrolyzers. And we've seen reports out there that attribute a value to our, to the Norris state in that JV uh, higher than uh, what we valued the whole of the Nora, just to say how, how fast things are moving. And so with that as a background, we're now assessing strategic options uh, around this uh, very attractive investment that we've made, and we'll keep you posted as as those uh, um, those thoughts uh, come to to some decision. We're receiving a lot of inbound interest, both for Denora and for the platform concept. And we're now working on different levels. One is kind of a, a more technology venture capital level for uh, small amounts of of capital, including some regulated. Um, uh, investment money that could be made available, that will be made available by the regulator, and then we're, we're working uh, around kind of some 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 bigger idea uh, based around the NAR. Alex, please on the international on the on the cost of debt. Thank you. 
So on, on in 2020, the, the significant reduction, as I said, was uh, the result of uh, <coughs> three actions on, on one side, the benefits from uh, the 2019 liability management, uh, the benefits from commercial papers that have been a fantastic instrument to um, uh, use, I mean, to manage our short-term funding requirements deeply in negative yield. Deep, when I say deeply, I mean below minus 40 basis points. Uh, and the bond rollover effects of old issuance that still were at uh, uh, coupons much higher than where today we, we can print a trade. Looking forward uh, in terms of where, and this is what has allowed us to achieve the 0.9 that I commented before. Looking at 2021, what I can say is that we have completed the, uh, another liability management exercise in December that uh, uh, gives a benefit on our cost of funding for 2021 of slightly less than 10 million. And today we already sit between what we've done and what we have locked in on other few millions of, uh, of uh, optimization or treasury management optimization, which yields the 15 million that, uh, that Marco commented before. Uh, we remain opportunistic. Uh, we think that this is a unique environment uh, in which funding is really um, at advantageous conditions, and we are trying to extend maturity and do pre-funding before uh, rates may start to rise again, which is uh, similar to the question you asked on inflation, a little bit of the what we are starting to see more recently uh, from, from some of the market indicators. Thank you. The next question is from uh, Jose Ruiz with Barclays. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, and thanks for taking my questions. I have uh, three. Uh, first of all, if you could explain a little bit why have you increased the guidance for net debt in 2021. Uh, secondly, uh, related to the previous question, in the case uh, that we would see um, a cut in the allowed WAC, uh, what could you do in terms of um, optimizing, further optimizing your cost of debt and bringing it further down? And uh, the last question, uh, yeah, regarding the agreement with ERA, um, which I found very interesting, uh, could you replicate that uh, with other municipalities? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jorge Luis. So, um, on the, the first question on the debt, it's just the NORA that wasn't included in the previous guidance. And so, uh, you have you have the data for that. Uh, the allowed WAC. The uh, these are distinct activities. Everything Ali just said on debt, we will do regardless of the WAC, and whatever efficiency program uh, we can launch, even though with 60, 63 million already achieved, a lot higher than originally anticipated. We don't have much more we can expect. In fact, we have very little we can expect on, on the cost-cutting side. And on the revenue side, whatever growth we can get on output-based, uh, new investments, uh, some overtime, uh, some inflation adjustments. But it's not as if there's something that we will activate uh, based on the WAC determination. As I mentioned earlier, we will try to work to mitigate this impact. It's a joint effort with most of the other utilities. And I think it's uh, on the positive side, there's a favorable investment cycle with people expecting companies like us to step in and spend CapEx also to help uh, the economies uh, recover from uh, COVID. Uh, but and there's also some maybe positive inflation expectation, but we have to deal with the fact that spreads are a lot lower and, uh, and uh, that's just the way the market is. On HERA, um, we like these types of deals. We've announced... Uh, an agreement with any as well, and we are open to uh, offering these types of opportunities uh, to whichever utility is interested. Uh, we want to make our knowledge available almost with an open source when it comes to things like biomethane, for example, where it's in countries' interest and in our own interest that we have as much biomethane flowing through our network, as many connections, new connections made to our network. Uh, which makes our infrastructure become more and more renewable, and the quicker that is, the quicker uh, we can uh, we can achieve net zero, not just for SNAM, which is confirmed at 2040, but also for 
our customers. So we're launching a platform. We'll uh, provide more details in a few weeks to make this type of know-how available to uh, whoever wants to use it on a non-discriminatory basis. Thank you. The next question is from James Brand with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have uh, just one question, and it's not really on the results. It's on decarbonisation, um, possibly slightly left of field, but um, I'll try it on you anyway because I know you're very both very excellent at answering kind of decarbonisation questions around hydrogen and things like that. Um, so the question is, if, if the end game for your network is that we're probably – putting 100% hydrogen through it. Uh, and the position today is we're putting pretty much 100% natural gas. How do you see the, the kind of transition between the two? Because it strikes me that that's, in some respects, the most difficult element of, 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 of the process is how do you get from, from one to another? If industry wants to switch to 100% hydrogen, you can obviously start blending hydrogen alongside natural gas, but that's very different from, you know, from, from that demand that might be coming from industry. I'd just be interested in any thoughts on how you think you, you get from, from one to the other. Thanks. James, that's an excellent question. That's what we're putting our best minds uh, at work uh, to solve because it will depend on which part of the uh, network we're in. We have parts of our networks in Italy and other countries where we have some redundancy, so we can rather quickly move to having two or uh, or even three systems. And we have other parts where we don't have that redundancy and we will need to uh, prioritize one over the other. When I say two to three systems, it's not going to be fossil methane uh, to hydrogen. It's going to be fossil methane and biomethane are the same molecules, so they will uh, they will be together, they will be blended, and they will be blended for a very long time uh, because it's essentially the same thing. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen, the blending is just a tactical move to get the market going to create demand with low effort, with no changes to anything else. So it's a, it's a way to just generate that demand. But over time, uh, blending is not the most um, effective way we will need dedicated hydrogen infrastructure. If you look at European uh, projections now available for 2050, they expect the green gases to account for the same amount of energy as today is fossil methane by 2050 with some biomethane, some hydrogen. Keep in mind that hydrogen has more volume, so the same energy amount means more volumes in our pipes, and also some methane with CCS. So we will have, in a nutshell, we will have biomethane, we will have, uh, say, blue and, and green hydrogen in the same pipeline, and we will have methane uh, delivered at power plants and CCS done at the power plant, for example. And so we may also need some parts of our or other people's networks to transport CO2 over shorter distances. So there's many variables at play. It depends on, as I said, the network configuration, how demand and supply evolve, but we will need to get ready to transport all three uh, types of gases. Thank you very much. Interesting. As a reminder, if you wish to register for a question, please press star and one on your telephone. The next question is from Bartek Kubik. Kubitsky with Société Générale. Please go ahead. Hello and good, uh, good, good afternoon. I would have two questions, please. Uh, firstly, you mentioned on the on the allowed back uh, reset. You mentioned there are uh, there are arguments for actually changing the formula. And uh, would you mind sharing those arguments uh, with us, please? I mean. Uh, Obviously, I mean, if something happens that the WAG is changed, that's good for that is good for you, but it is somehow distort the discontinuity of uh, of the regulations, uh, the continuity of the regulations. So maybe, uh, I mean, what is your view on this one, and well, how and how do you think investors will, will uh, look at this? Because contrary to that, or symmetrically that, uh, once the 
the spreads are widening, uh, maybe the regulator may say, look, the spreads are too wide, we will also change the formula, uh, not in your favor anymore. And secondly, uh, on storage uh, and hydrogen, I mean, uh, obviously, as, uh, as you mentioned as well, hydrogen needs much more volumes than normal gas. Do you think, as a consequence, there will be a lot of storage investment opportunities in Italy, or do you think the storage level you are having will be enough to accommodate the switch from natural gas to hydrogen or hydrogen blend. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bartek. So on the, on the WAC, uh, I think it's prudent to wait. You'll hear news coming out of us and the regulator in the coming months. I don't want to create any expectation that we expect the formula to be overhauled. There's some technical elements as to how the country risk premium is calculated uh, that could could be adjusted because, quite frankly, the, the logic is strong to just neutralize some of those adjustments. Um, uh, and uh, and I think there are arguments, uh, uh, hopefully, to be made to if if there is, um, let's say, not artificially low, but uh, an extraordinarily low uh, lack um, coming out of an observation period in an extraordinary time like this one with so much liquidity uh, available and spreads at record lows, I think there's an argument to try to normalize it somehow. But it's early days and uh, it's not going to be an easy and simple uh, process. On storage, I expect uh, that storage will be uh, one of the more exciting parts of the energy transition. That's both for batteries, and you're already seeing a number of gigafactories for batteries and utility-scale batteries, but essentially all the renewable growth will require uh, much more uh, storage. And when it comes to hydrogen, because of the volumes, as you discussed, we need a lot more storage in Italy and elsewhere. On the south caverns, it's uh, quite straightforward, and they, they're already being used for hydrogen. When it comes to our reservoirs, it's not so easy uh, to... Uh, model in for 100% hydrogen. Even if we could put in 100% hydrogen, that would still leave us with uh, a significant need for new uh, storage projects to be developed. The good news for us is that even if you take some of the more complex and advanced hydrogen storage projects, they are still a lot cheaper than any of the energy storage alternatives, whether it's batteries or um, pumped hydro where not only uh, it's expensive, but it's uh, very difficult to see uh, the, the infrastructure being built in many, many countries in Europe where there's a lot of opposition to new uh, infrastructure like that. Okay, thank you. And if I may follow up, do you think you will need a lot of investments to adjust your depleted oil uh, reservoirs to sort of adjust them to, to be hydrogen? Ready or, or or not? What do you think about this? Sorry, to adjust what to hydrogen? I mean, your current storage. I think it is not. You are not able to store hundred percent of hydrogen, right? Because you are using the old uh, gas uh, gas reservoirs or, or gas old gas fields. So my question is whether it needs a lot of investments to actually make those storage hydrogen ready. It's uh, it's not so much about the investments. It's about the interaction between the um, the hydrogen and the methane and some bacteria that are present in the reservoir. And uh, so tests are ongoing, and uh, we're uh, we know there's something to be done. We don't know yet if it's a blend. We don't know if it's going to be pure hydrogen, and as I said, how that interacts with the materials. At, that has to do with facilities and some of the bacteria inside the reservoir. And another promising idea is to have a circular uh, CCS mechanism so that you're actually storing CH4, which is methane, but you're pumping in and pumping out, essentially, the hydrogen keeping the CO2 underground. So there's a lot of work and cutting-edge research being done. I think this is now the frontier of, of energy infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, there are no more questions registered at this time. Do you, have, do you perhaps have any closing comments? No, I don't have any further comments. Thank you, everyone, for your time and your questions. And as always, any follow-on questions, you can get in touch with our team here. Thank you.